Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jay Margulis. Um, about eight or nine years ago, I got my start as a, uh, a game developer. I've released games on Steam. Has anybody here heard of Steam before? Mm -hmm. Pretty popular game platform. I've worked with what's called Nerdcore Rappers. Uh, so when they release their albums, I make games for those. I've published games as well. And so that's how I got my start with games, and that's part of what this talk is about today. And um, quickly from there, I transitioned into making hardware platforms. So uh, I currently teach in the School of Design at DePaul University um, in our interaction design and game design programs. And I teach students how to make uh, hardware platforms for games, and I also make them myself. So you see the examples up there of some of the things that I've made in the past. And I'll be talking about them a little bit as examples uh, going forward, but the numbers there I started out making you know one-off kind of things, and it quickly escalated until um, just this last weekend. I released 1,600 custom hardware badges for a conference called ThoughtCon, which is a hacker security conference in Chicago. Um, so that's a project that I've been working on for about the past three years. I also, in, uh, in addition to making things, I hack things. So I uh, recently finished up a student project where we hacked these little obnoxious Amazon Dash buttons. Um, and turned it into a foraging game where you had to forage for the different, uh, you know, Bounty or Glad or Doritos and then craft things with those buttons. So in addition to making things, I teach students and other people how to hack things. And then just to kind of give you an idea of where I'm coming from, um, I also run a, I'm the director of a 5,000 square foot um, makerspace in the DePaul, on the DePaul Loop campus, as well as, um, uh, another makerspace called Space Lab in the south suburbs of Chicago. I'm guessing there's nobody else from the Midwest here. Yeah, so. Uh, one, really? Uh, where from? Indiana. Indiana, okay, okay. Uh, and I run a maker fair. So, today I want to talk a little bit about um, designing your own game platforms. Uh, and we're going to use some of the projects uh, I've worked on in the past as case studies of making big, messy game console things, also known as conference badges. How many of you, really quick, have been to a conference where you've had a custom circuit? DEF CON, maybe, or, yeah, DEF CON? Okay, yep, all right. So, so enough people here are kind of exposed to this idea that instead of going to a conference and getting like a regular paper badge or laminated badge, you get some circuit board that probably costs anywhere between 20 to $50 a unit. And it does usually some kitschy kind of goofy thing, you know, LEDs light up or something like that. Um, I'm also going to read off of my notes, actually, that I have here, too, so you'll have to excuse me, but this is, uh, this is based on a couple of stuff I've been writing, a couple of things I've been writing about, so I want to be very clear about some of this stuff. Um, so before we, we get into the badges, I, I want to talk a little bit about why it's important for game developers and designers um, to pursue creating their own platforms and what it means for games and design to be able to create the platforms that you make games for. So first I want to talk about systems thinking. Uh, which is the process by which we understand how systems and the components that those systems are comprised of work together in order to generate complex interactions. You can think of systems thinking as understanding uh, how the body works, for instance, um, in that the body is comprised of many different organs, uh, tissues, etc., uh, that all work together to keep you alive and uh, help you travel through meat space. Uh, systems thinking is quite simply Something that we've lost more and more uh, as we've become a highly specialized society uh, that focuses on the understanding of components rather than how components contribute to the whole system. Uh, as a result of this specialization, fewer people understand the entire system, generally speaking, of course, that we interact with on a daily basis, which leads me to this statement, everything around us is magic and nobody knows how anything works anymore. I sound like a really old man saying that. Uh, whether that's the, the, the body, or whether it's a system like our phones, which is a black box essentially, or systems of governance and organization, uh, systems of, of uh, academic politics like at my university, DePaul, um, which for those of you who work in academia know that that can get pretty hairy. Um, but even simple systems like buttons that you'd be surprised how many students um, you know, don't know how things like buttons or Things like electromagnetism, you know, something very fundamental that our, our, uh, our entire systems rely on uh, work. Also, for the purpose of this talk, uh, actual systems, right? Game system, game console. So if uh, any of you recognize this, I congratulate you. This is the inside of an Xbox One. 
So very complex systems with parts that we don't really know what they do in them. So systems have become complex. They've become hard to navigate. And as a result, we tend not to scratch below the surface, but instead work on top of them. Uh, for this, uh, systems thinking is useful. It helps one understand the system that they are engaging with in order to best take advantage of its components toward achieving an end. However, systems thinking only advocates for an understanding of a system in order to leverage its components. But what if the components are broken or extraneous? Uh, and really, how do we determine if the components in the system or the system itself is worthy of existence at all? This leads me to a form of system th systems thinking that I think goes quite a great, uh, does quite a great job of illustrating my point. There's an excellent book called Racing the Beam about the Atari 2600 by Paul Manafort and Ian Bogust. Um, and it's about the Atari 2600 and the people who made games for it. Racing the Beam literally meant that um, because the Atari did not have its own GPU, program programmers had to race the beam drawn on the television screen line by line by line, perfectly timing their graphics in order to get their games to work properly. Or put simply, they had to understand the system that they were creating games for, and only by understanding that system could they take advantage of the medium they were creating for. Platform studies advocates, just as systems thinking does, that for, for those who craft games, it is not good enough to know how to write software that makes games, but that one must understand the hardware in order to truly create something expressive that takes advantage of the affordances of the medium. I would go even further and say that it's not good enough to understand the systems that you're developing for, but that you must be able to take them apart, remix them, make them, and hack them. Only after game designers can liberate themselves from the constraints of console manufacturers can games fully realize, realize themselves as an expressive and creative medium. All right, so here we go. Uh, this talk, this is one of my favorite quotes from a book. Uh, this talk is about created objects and the environment, which is to say it's a talk about everything, um, which is a bold, <laughs> bold and possibly inaccurate statement. Um, so it's also about the three things I've learned by making custom hardware stuff, AKA conference badges. So a quick preface, this talk could easily be about all the technical challenges and limitations that we've faced when making badges. Uh, there are many of them. And when I say me, I mean my DePaul, or we, I mean my DePaul students as well as my co-collaborator, uh, Rudy Ristich. So there are many of these challenges. Um, and there are many, many more of these challenges than simply making a video game using something like Unity or Unreal or some other technology like that. Um, this talk uh, could also be about the somewhat haphazard and slapdash approach that we sometimes take to making hardware things, which I'd like to call the creative process, um, but which might better resemble a team of belligerent horses gone wild down an unkempt country road. It really is kind of haphazard, so. Um, and which in the end boils down to a lot of creative research and process followed up with a simple statement of taste. I like this, I think we should do it this way. Um, I could also say that while I'm quite comfortable talking about the hardware limitations of the specific projects that I've worked on, many of those problems I solve in partnership with my creative partner, Rudy Ristich. Um, here he's looking surprised that he's in my presentation. Uh, <laughs> uh, who helps with a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to the hardware. In other words, I am by no means an expert in electrical engineering. I am a designer. I teach design in a design school. I'm a de that's what I do by trade. So instead, I want to talk about the design challenges, opportunities, and most importantly, the considerations that need to be taken into account when making custom hardware game things and badges. In other words, I'm going to talk about the big hairy word called design. Okay, so here we go. We're going to talk about three things, um, context, uh, interaction, and fragmentation. And we're going to talk about three badges that I've made and how they each kind of exemplify uh, these three design considerations. So the first thing or design consideration I'd like to talk about is context. Uh, the Thotcon OX8 badge, which was uh, for an event last year, was a device with three potentiometers and four RGB LEDs, one, two, three, and then you can see the LEDs uh, dispersed throughout the badge. When interfacing with it, uh, users navigated a two-dimensional puzzle much like a chessboard using the first two potentiometers for the X and Y axis and the last one to move through layers. And I have an example here that kind of shows this. Uh, remember I said haphazard. Um, 
much like these early sketches illustrate. So the LEDs would indicate what was uh, in front of, behind, left, and right of the user. Pen potentiometers help you navigate spaces. And importantly, the puzzles, this is very important actually, were all stored in EEPROM, uh, which leads to my first lesson about making conference badges and custom game things, uh, which is context. So here you can see almost like laid out like a chessboard. You have a, you know, the A, B, C letters down at the bottom and the numbers on the left. And if you took a look at the, the badge, here you have the numbers and the letters and you would turn the dials to navigate the space. Okay, so remember the EEPROM, uh, the thing, uh, and, and context. The things that people interact with, both in their homes and in public environments, are seated within a larger context of other types of things which must also be taken into account when researching how the user interacts with ubiquitous computers. For example, context is important as it relates to how users expect an interaction to fit into their current working models. So, when you're at a hacker conference, uh, where the people interface with your custom hardware, uh, both A, have the capabilities to hack it, <laughs> and B, the desire to solve puzzles, they end up doing some interesting things uh, that related to context like dumping your puzzles from EEPROM and solving them on pen and paper. So what's important to note here is that this is an easily anticipated thing if one thinks about the context of an event uh, where you expect people to hack things. Namely, an event where people are expected to take things apart and discover their hidden truths uh, creates a context uh, that's critical to understand when designing embedded games. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is explicit and implicit interaction. Uh, the way that users engage with devices can be explicit or implicit. Explicit means of interacting with a device involve intent in that the user must actively and purposefully engage with the device. Implicit interaction, on the other hand, is where the user is simply going about their daily lives and sensors actively collect information and respond to their behavior. As we continue to embed computers into our daily lives, the explicit nature by which we interact with things is being changed and shifted more towards implicit forms of interaction. Think of the Nest Learning thermostat where walking in front of it indicates that you're at home instead of having to walk and turn the dial. Sadly, I don't have a lot of pictures from the big data outbreak game that I'm showing here. Uh, there are a lot of gory stories behind um, the state of mind that we were all in after we made this involving a lot of late nights and no sleep. Um, but if I were to describe the badge, uh, basically, we released 500 circuit boards at a conference, and one board entered with a virus. As the infected badge came within proximity of other badges, the virus spread, and we visualized the spread live on kiosks dispersed throughout the event. By the way, this was also happening during the, the Zika outbreak, so it had some other political relevance as well. So when thinking about implicit interactions, the badges were all communicating with each other invisibly and spreading a disease. Now, you can imagine people who passed the kiosks were quite curious as to why many of the numbered circles that began green during the event were rapidly changing to red as the event wore on. What you might not have thought about yet is that when people began understanding what was happening, uh, they began to change their behavior at the event. In other words, the attendees who were playing the game began avoiding other attendees. Um, <laughs> Not something that, that the people who were running the conference enjoyed, uh, but I thought that was pretty funny as a game designer. So in a very meaningful way, how users' devices implicitly interacted with each other changed the way that they navigated space and approached or didn't approach, in this case, other people at the event. So that's the power of implicit interaction when you're making things like these conference game badges. Finally, I want to talk about fragmentation. So fragmentation is built into the very nature of physical computing devices, as it is in view other hybridized forms of media, and requires the, use, the user to reconcile that fragmentation. Fragmentation emerges when one does not directly receive feedback from the thing that they're interacting with, and therefore they do not immediately see how a system or object is responding to their behavior. In other words, since ubiquitous computing or UbiComp devices are not physically interconnected, but instead connected and mediated through the internet, the nature of that connection is not whole, but instead fragmented. This creates a seemingly disjointed system that both influences how users navigate the use of a device and places responsibility on a designer to consider how the user, that user navigates through the designed experience. 
So for SOTCON OX9, the, the, the last badge I'm going to talk about, which was literally last weekend, so these are all, this is all new information. We built a badge that allowed people, people to play, uh, amongst many other games, um, a game that we called SOTCON Plays Pokemon. So the badge connected to an IRC server through a client on, the bat, on it, uh, and collaborate, allowed people to collaboratively play a game of Pokemon together by selecting inputs on the badge and changing the state of the game on a projected screen. So for those of you who have heard of anybody Twitch plays Pokemon before, okay, a couple of yeses. Uh, ha ha, right? Uh, so the important thing to note is that the actions one took on the badge did not have clear feedback unless one was in the room with the screen that was displaying the game, and they understood the connection between the screen, the game, and the badge. What ended up happening as a result of this fragmentation was that users who were sitting on conference talks, much like this one, uh, throughout the building and were not in the room with the game, would send random inputs to Pokemon, the Pokemon game, because they had no idea what they were doing. Um, much to the chagrin of individuals who were attempting to play the game live and in person. While intentional, this was intentional, I wanted to frustrate people, um, this disjointed interaction showcases the effect of creating game devices that are in interconnected and show, in this case, purf purposefully, little feedback between user action and game state. Okay, so where does this leave us? Uh, first, by understanding the hardware and the environment that the hardware resides in, essentially the three things we discussed, the three, con the, uh, three affordances that we discussed, um, one can create interesting, unexpected, and until now, undiscovered experiences that could not be made through traditional game platforms. So there are basically three game console manufacturers out there, Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo, and they dictate how we speak, right? As game designers and creators, um, they control our voice in some way, shape, or form. Uh, furthermore, by having control of the platforms that the games reside on, we were able to fully take advantage of the technical affordances of the platform. So in the case of the ThoughtCon OX9 badges, we use something called an ESP8266, which is a really inexpensive piece of hardware, about $1.80 per unit with Wi-Fi on it. So what do you do? You use the Wi-Fi, right? In the case of three potentiometers and lights, that was pretty tough. You have to figure out how to use that. Um, but those are the technical affordances of the platform. Um, and finally, by understanding, but more importantly, being authors of the platforms that our game resi games resided on, we were able to create new and unique in systems of interaction that, while messy, have the potential to change how people think about games, how they think about the space around them, and how they experience play. All right, so that's, with that being said, I wanted to, I think we have to end a couple minutes early, and I can take maybe a couple questions. I have a little, bad, has anybody heard of Badge Life, Drew, except for Drew in the back? I have a little Badge Life porn. So this is a couple of my students, uh, Scrooge McDucking, on some of the ThoughtCon OX9 badges that we did. And here's a picture of the OX8 ones, and there's a Nerf gun in there. So I thought that would be another good, uh, good picture to showcase some of the stuff we made. All right, so that's my little design talk. Thanks.